your Bibles and open those up to the book of Proverbs. Uh, the book of Proverbs chapter 3 is where we're going to be here in just a moment. So thankful that you're here today and so thankful we get to spend this time together. We are in a sermon series simply called Always True. And if you're new with us or visiting with us, let me catch you up and kind of explain to you what we've been doing. We have been looking at the promises of God. We have been looking at the promises of God, the things that are always true, okay? The things that you can count on. And where we started, in, and as we started this whole sermon series was in 1st, 2nd Peter chapter 1, verses 3 and 4. Because in 2nd Peter chapter 1, in those two verses there, um, Peter describes God's promises as exceedingly great and precious, and the reason we began with that thought is because we have to do away with all of our preconceived notions of promises. Because chances are, you've been promised a few things and somebody failed to deliver on a promise. And so when somebody says the words promise to you, you automatically in your own mind think, yeah, right. Because after all, we've grown up in a culture, finish this phrase for me, if it sounds too good to be true... Then it always is, right? We, that's, that's, that's our mantra almost that we seem to chant these days that, whoa, well, they can't deliver on that. Man, I'm telling you this morning that God's promises are always true. Always true. Uh, let me ask you, have you ever uh, bought anything off of an infomercial? Anybody ever buy anything off an infomercial? Raise your hand if you've done that before. No, oh, you saw something advertised? Okay, a little confession time. I like infomercials because the product that is always being advertised isn't not true. They always advertise it as the greatest product that will revolutionize your life, right? Uh, have you ever purchased one of those things? Well, that brings me to this. I want to show you an advertisement for the auto hammer. Have you guys ever heard of the auto hammer? Well, let's watch the video on this if we can. Um, it's a YouTube video that is a commercial. This is the actual commercial, the actual advertisement for the auto hammer, okay? Your old hammer have you fumbling with nails, balancing on ladders, and smashing your fingers. Not anymore. Introducing the auto hammer, the world's first one-handed automatic hammer. Just drop in a handful of nails, press the button, and hammer away. It's that easy. Watch again. The auto hammer does all the work for you. It's perfect for time-consuming projects that require lots of nails, saving you heaps of time. Tight spots are difficult the old-fashioned way, but with the auto hammer, they're a breeze. And because of the easy one-handed operation, you can now hold things with your free hand. Why do this when you can hammer carefree with the auto hammer? The secret is a unique chamber that feeds one nail to the head. There, it's magnetically held. On contact, it's let go straight every time. It's so simple. You can have one hand tied behind your back and still use the auto hammer. With the auto hammer, my jobs go smoother, safer, and a heck of a lot faster. With the auto hammer, you can build a backyard deck without boxes of nails. Reach high places with just one hand and no ladder. The auto hammer is virtually indestructible. And with the nail already in place, you'll achieve pinpoint accuracy every time. Look, nail guns can cost as much as 100. You can have the auto hammer for just $19.95. But it gets better. We'll include this handy clip-on level. It's perfect to straighten a shelf, fixture, or level a picture. Yours free. But there's more, lots more. We'll give you 100 all-purpose nails to use the second you get your auto hammer absolutely free. Try the auto hammer. And if it's not the best tool you've ever used, we'll buy it back. No questions asked. Call now. Call 1-800-391-0909 to order the auto hammer for just okay. $19.95. Okay. I mean, are you familiar with the auto hammer? Raise your hand if you've seen that advertisement or have seen it in the stores. Raise your hands. Bob Lemley has one. <laughs> you and me, Bob. You, you and me. I bought one of these things. I thought, oh! It's going to be so awesome. It's going to be so easy. And um, the best thing about that, what's that? When did you ever work? 
<laughs> when did I ever work that I would need it? The answer is never. I'm telling you. I, here's the thing with this auto hammer, though. I, I'm guessing we got Ryan Johnson and Roy Day here. Okay, they're with one family. I'm guessing this is not in their toolbox. Okay, because the auto hammer is worthless. Okay. Um, I, you know, as I was thinking about this, and I, and I purchased. Oh, I gotta show you this too, if I can find it. Um, I, I, the best thing about when I purchased this, it came with the little, uh, uh, the little pocket. You know, the little pocket uh, uh, level they were talking about there. I still have probably 50 nails never never used that came with the auto hammer, okay? But as I was using this thing, the one thing that would frustrate me is that it was not as advertised. You, you, okay, let me just show you, okay? I'm pressing the button. There's got nails in here, okay? Pressing the button, nothing's even coming out, okay? I mean, first of all, that's a big problem, all right? That kind of, you know, de defeats the purpose of the one-handed hammer because now it takes two hands to position the nail and hammer, okay? Second major problem problem is that the handle is constructed of plastic, okay? I mean, I, I grew up with, with hammers and, and things when I was a kid, and they, I think those plastic handles were a little bit more durable even than this was, okay? Third thing I found to be a problem with this is once you did get a nail positioned there, unless you had the accuracy of like a, uh, an army sniper to hit it where you wanted to hit it, this does absolutely no good for me, okay? And maybe I should call that, that number back and see if they can give me my, my, my money back on, on the auto hammer, all right? But the problem is, we live in a culture that always over-promises and under-delivers, don't we? That's our culture. That's the problem we have when we're thinking about promises. When we talk about God's exceedingly great and precious promises, in the back of your mind, you're thinking, yeah, right. Let me tell you something. God is much better. He's much bigger than an auto hammer, okay? He always comes through. Never fails. In fact, that's what the first promise that we looked at in Hebrews chapter 13 is that I will not fear because God is with me. What can man do to me? Whom shall I fear? If God is for me, who can be against me? Well, today, I want to look at the second promise. The second promise that we find in God's word is that God is in control. God is the one who's in control. He's got it. You don't have to worry. You don't have to fret. You don't have to wonder. God is in control. I will not doubt. We're going to be looking at Proverbs chapter 3, uh, verses 5 and 6. Now, feel free to raise your hand. I'm not going to call on you, okay? I promise I will not call on you. But raise your hands if you're familiar with these two verses and maybe even put these two verses to memory. Yeah, a lot of us have. And, and in fact, some commentators have said that Proverbs chapter 3, verses 5 and 6 is kind of like the John 3.16 of the Old Testament. It's well known. It's well known. And uh, so we're going to look at these uh, verses here this morning. Just a couple of verses. Proverbs chapter 3, uh, verses 5 and 6. Trust in the Lord with all of your heart, and do not lean on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him, and he will make your paths straight. What I want to do this morning is I want to break these two verses down into four phrases. Uh, and I want to study these four phrases. And so we're going to begin with the first phrase. And the first phrase is this. Trust in the Lord with all of your heart. You see, this is God's instruction. This is God's exhortation to not doubt. Think about your doubt just for a moment. Have you ever doubted God, his truth, his faithfulness, his love? What doubt does to your soul and your relationship can be comparable to what infidelity does to your marriage. It, it shatters it. And, and God wants us as his children to trust him, to rely on him. And he hates it when we doubt. And it shatters our soul. It devastates our soul. It damages us so deeply, doubt does. Here's some of the consequences that, that doubt gives. First of all, uh, doubt is the soil that fear grows in. It produces fear. Fear can never be unless at first uh, there is not doubt. Jesus has been crucified and has now been resurrected. And uh, Jesus, as he's, uh, before he goes back to heaven, he stumbles upon these two gentlemen who are walking on a road. And the, the road they're traveling just happens to lead them to Emmaus. And he overhears them talking. 
And, and they're talking about all the events that have taken place that, wow, this Jesus of Nazareth, he was crucified, and he, was, but he's, he wasn't there when they rolled with it. He, where did he go? And, and, and they were talking about this, but they had some doubts that were leading into it. Well, I guess it's not exactly how God told us it would be because they said that he was going to be the Messiah, but he's just not around. Well, Jesus does something really awesome. He goes in their midst and he walks among them. And he decides that he's going to disguise himself a little bit. He's kind of incognito and he keeps his identity from being revealed to them. But in Luke chapter 24 verses 36 through 38, Jesus confronts these two men. And Jesus, it says there that while they were telling these things, Jesus himself stood in their midst. And he said to them, peace be to you. But they were startled and they were frightened. And they thought that they were seeing a spirit. And he said to them, why are you troubled? And why do doubts arise in your hearts? Jesus is basically saying them, to them, you know, don't, don't fear. Don't let your doubts lead to the fear that is rising within your hearts. Because I've made some promises to you. And you don't believe the promises and that's why you're afraid. The fear you have is because the, you doubt things will work out as God has said they're going to work out. Here's the second consequence of doubt. Doubt is the cause of the ups and downs of our emotions. It's, it's responsible for, for um, emotional instability. In the book of James, uh, James, these are some well-known verses here. In the book of James, in the context as James is talking about trials and tribulations, James says this, But if any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask God, who gives generously to all without reproach, and it will be given to him. James basically starting off and is like, Hey, you want to know why that bad thing is happening to you in your life? Go ask God. He'll tell you. He'll tell you why this thing is happening to you. Uh, but if you do that, you need to make sure that you do it in faith. You need to go to God trusting that he's going to reveal the answer because as he says in verse 6, but he must ask in faith without any doubting. For the one who doubts is like the surf of the sea, driven and tossed by the wind. For that man ought not to expect that he will receive anything from the Lord, being a double-minded man, unstable in all of his ways. You see, what James here is saying is that doubt causes one of these things to happen, the, the emotional instability, the highs and the lows. It's the roller coaster of life that we've all been on from time to time, but, but if, if that doubt is not kept in check, then we're, we're left fretting and wondering about, oh no, what's going to happen to me? What's going to happen in the future? And all of that is caused by doubt. You see, living by faith is the life that's supposed to be characterized by the Christian. Living by faith. Holding firmly to the promises that God has set forth. That is what gives stability and strength to the Christian life. And, and I'm not living by what I see happening around me. I, I'm, not, I'm not, it doesn't matter what happens there or over there or over here. Because God has made some promises. He said a few things. And I don't know how this is going to end up, and I don't know when it's going to end up, but I know it's going to happen exactly as God has said it's going to happen, because I trust God. And living by faith gets off of the emotional roller coaster, the emotional instability of life. Well, here's the third thing. Doubt is the direct result of taking our eyes off of Jesus. I love this account. It's in Matthew chapter 14, and if you've grown up in church, then you know exactly where I'm going with this. But in Matthew chapter 14, uh, Jesus' disciples are in a boat. He told them to get in this boat, and I'll meet you on the other side of the shore. And uh, they're on this lake, and you know the story. All of a sudden, a huge storm comes up, right? And it's so bad that the uh, disciples thought they were going to die. But then all of a sudden, they see this figure walking out on top of the water. Well, listen to the story unfold in verse 28 of Matthew chapter 14. Peter said to Jesus, Lord, if it is you, command me to come to you on the water. And Jesus said, come. And so Peter got out of the boat and walked on the water and came towards Jesus. But seeing the wind, he became frightened. And beginning to sink, he cried out, Lord, save me. Immediately, Jesus stretched out his hand and took hold of him and said to him, You have little faith. Why did you doubt? When they got into the boat, the wind stopped. And those who were in the boat worshipped Jesus, saying, You certainly are the Son of God. Man, I love that. I love that account. Why do I doubt? I don't want to doubt. Why do I doubt? I'll tell you why you'll doubt. It's because you're not looking at the Lord anymore. When your eyes aren't on the Lord, man, turmoil categorizes your life. 
But when your eyes are on the Lord, your heart and, is filled with hope and faith. When your eyes are on the wind and the waves, man, what's going to happen to you? You're going to start to sink. And when you're in the middle of a great and terrifying storm, those things can seem very, very daunting. The wind can seem terrifying. The wind, the waves can seem overwhelming. And your eyes are all over the place looking at everything except what you're called to look at. And that's Jesus. And Jesus in the midst of your storm is like, look at me. Focus on me. Look at me. Concentrate on me. I'm here with you. It's going to be okay. We've all been there. And so I can tell you firsthand that if you're looking at how big the storm is in your life, if you're focused on how big your problems are, your health, your finances, your marital relationships, you fill in the blank. If your eyes have been on the difficulties of this life and not on Jesus, it's because you have doubts. Look, the Christian life is supposed to be a life of faith. And when you hold on to the promises that God has told you about, God said it, I believe it, that settles it. And I don't know exactly how, I don't know exactly when, but as the text says, trust in the Lord with all your heart. With all your heart. Total commitment with everything that you have. And how many want to do that? How many are doing that? And maybe you're like, well, I'm not sure if I'm doing that. I want to. Well, maybe this next phrase will help you decide whether or not you're trusting in the Lord with all of your heart. Because it says, lean not on your own understanding. Don't lean on your own understanding. You're not trusting God with all of your heart if you're leaning on your own wisdom to hold you up. And the older you get, you can probably relate to this, the older that, that we've gotten, you know, we know a few more things than we did 15 years ago. We've been around the block where experiences have helped us in life. But listen, that's not a bad thing to learn. But if you're placing more stock and, and more, um, you know, fruit in, in what you know rather than who God is, then that's a problem. Because eventually your confidence will wane and then what will happen? Doubt. The Bible is filled with story after story of both sides of this coin, of those who've leaned on their own understanding, but also the Bible is filled with story after story about those who've leaned on the Lord and trusted his plans even when it didn't make sense. I don't have this morning to go through all the stories, but I'm going to tell you two. The first story is the story of Pharaoh. And his story is, is one in which he trusted in his own understanding. He thought, I've got this. I'm Pharaoh. I'm king. I know what's best. In the book of Exodus, we see Pharaoh had over a million slaves working for him. But there was one problem. God told Pharaoh to let those slaves go. Because the slaves that Pharaoh was using and abusing were God's children. It was the nation of Israel, the Israelites, God's chosen race. And Pharaoh thought, that doesn't make any sense. I'm going to do what I feel is right. I'm going to do what I know to be right. I'm not letting these people go. Why would I want to give up my free labor? Well, God showed him why. And ten plagues later, Pharaoh thought, well, maybe it's not a bad idea to let the Israelites go. And so he does. He lets the Israelites leave Egypt. Only Pharaoh was stubborn, and he didn't want to lose those slaves, and so he has a change of heart and a change of mind. And so he chases after Moses and the Israelites to get them back. How'd that work out for him? Not great. You remember the story, don't you? The Israelites are pressed up against the Red Sea with nowhere seemingly to go. All of a sudden, God does a mighty work through Moses. The Red Sea is divided. The Israelites and Moses walk across on dry land. Here comes the Egyptians with Pharaoh and his army chasing after them. They try to walk across the dry land. As the Red Sea's been parted. But then what happens? They drown. Lean not on your own understanding. And that's a good message for a lot of us. Maybe there's some turmoil going on in, within your life right now. Do not make the mistake of leaning upon your own wisdom in that situation. Of what you think seems right. Especially if it's in violation of what God has said. Well, now I want to give you the second story of someone who leaned on God rather than their own understanding. And I've told this story before, but it's a great story. It's Peter's experience in Luke chapter 5. In those five verses, we see a miraculous story unfold. Let me fill you in on this. 
Simon Peter, uh, before he became a full-time follower of Jesus Christ, was a full-time fisherman. That was his earning. That was his job. That was the way he made his living. And so Peter and his fishing partners spent the night doing what they always did, uh, catching fish to earn money so they could live. This was his business. Well, the night was a huge failure. They caught nothing, not a thing. But then along comes Jesus and says, hey, you know what? Put your nets out again. What? Jesus, we've just been working hard all night long. I've been doing this my whole life. I know what I'm doing. I'm a fisherman. Why would I listen to you? What do you do again? Oh, that's right. You're a carpenter. That's not what, Je that's not what Peter said to him. Peter recognized that there was something different about this Jesus. He recognized that, you know what? I better listen to him. So Peter trusted God's ways instead of his own understanding. And what was the end result? Look at verse 6. When they had done this, when they had put down their nets, when they had obeyed Jesus, they enclosed a great quantity of fish and their nets began to break. Look, I've said this before, but it bears worth repeating. Obedience supersedes understanding. It doesn't matter whether or not you understand God's plans. If God has told you to do something, you do it, even if you don't understand it. Because when you do, when you do what God has asked you to do, you will be amazed at the blessing that flows from that obedience. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not on your own understanding. Here's the third thing we're to do. In all your ways, acknowledge him. What's that all about? In all your ways, acknowledge him. Uh, this is about God. This is about God's reputation. And I want to honor him in everything that I do. I want to please him. I don't want to just get myself out of the difficult situation I find myself in. I want to honor God in it. In all my ways, I'm going to acknowledge him. To declare that he is real. To those people who are watching this situation unfold in my life, I want to be uh, seen as a faithful follower of Jesus Christ. Declaring to everyone who's watching that God is real, that his ways are best. That's acknowledging him in all of your ways. Let me show you just a couple practical ways you can acknowledge him in some real life situations. Let's say you're facing a financial crisis. How do you acknowledge him in all your ways with your finances? Okay, so you've lost your job, or, or maybe sales aren't going well, things have been tight, not to mention the cost of gas and the, the rise in the cost of living. Things are tight, and we're getting behind, and the collectors are calling, and it's a problem. So what do we do in that? Well, you've determined that the financial belt around your home is going to be tightened. And I'd agree, it's not a bad plan to become super wise about your finances in that situation. But do you know where the first place spending is cut in a household, especially a Christian household, when the money is tight? Giving to the Lord. A lot of times that's the first thing on the budget. Oh man, we, you know what? We can't afford to give this. We'd love to, but things are tight right now. So, you know, sorry, sorry church. Sorry God. Let me ask you, is that trusting in the Lord with all your heart? Is that leaning on him? Or is that leaning on your own understanding of how you think things are going to work? Uh, do you know why the Bible speaks so much about money? It's not because God needs your money. It's not it at all. God doesn't need your money. He owns the, the, the cattle on a thousand hills, okay? The reason that the Bible has so much to say about money is because at the root of your money, giving to God is a faith issue. And if you think you're just going to hoard and save up and cut God out of the equation, listen, you need God to help you in those times. And maybe, just maybe, God has allowed you to go through this financial struggle to come into your life, to teach you some things. And if you think that you're going to graduate from the financial school of uh, stresses of life without God, without partnering with him, then it's not going to end well for you. Trust in the Lord with all of your heart. We're going to continue to tithe. We're going to continue to keep our commitments. We're going to trust that 90% with God is more than 100% with, just by ourselves. And that's what happens when we leave God out. We're, we're kind of by ourselves. And that might be how we got in the financial situation we find ourselves in, but that's not how we're going to get out of it. We're going to honor him. We're going to trust him. We're going to keep um, doing what the things he's asked us to do.
Let me ask you this question. It's rhetorical. I think we all know the answer to this. Do you think God doesn't know how much money you have in your bank account? Do you think God doesn't know what bills you have coming at the end of the week? God sees your situation. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him, especially when you're having a financial crisis. Here's another way that you can um, practically acknowledge him. Maybe some of you are going through a relationship crisis of some kind. I've got a problem with my mom, or I've got a problem with my kids, or I've got a problem with my spouse, and there's this friction, there's this tension that's there. How do I handle that? How do I acknowledge God in all ways? Well, I'm going to do what's right. I'm going to trust God to honor um, that he's going to do what he said he's going to do within my relationships. I'm not going to get petty. I'm not going to stoop to their level. I'm not going to try to look for revenge. I'm going to give those difficulties over to the Lord. And don't rush into a situation doing what you feel is right. Seek God's leading. Seek God's counsel. I could spend time talking about tons of other practical ways in which you could, in all of your ways, acknowledge him. But I want you to fill in the blank underneath point C. And I want you to write down the situation that you're dealing with right now. A difficulty that's in your life. And let me ask you this question. How are you acknowledging God in that situation? How are you practically declaring to those watching in this situation that God is sovereign, that God's in control, that his ways are best? Well, those are the three things that you are supposed to do. And now we get to the promise that God has made. And here's the promise that God has made. He's going to make your path straight. By the way, it should be worth noting, this is a conditional promise. Remember we talked about the difference between conditional and unconditional promises? God makes both, but this promise that your path will be made straight is a conditional promise. You have to do some stuff. You have to trust in the Lord with all your heart. You have to lean not on your own understanding. You have to acknowledge him in all your ways. And when you do that, well then God's going to be faithful to do his part. He will make your paths straight. Listen, life is uncertain. Life is difficult. And as we look down the road of life, there's a lot of things that we see as roadblocks standing between us and the outcome which we would like to have. How am I going to pay for my kids' college? Am I going to have enough to retire on? How can I afford health insurance? What if the doctor's results don't come back the way I want them to? The future can be very uncertain, can be very scary. But look, God has said, I'm going to pave the way. And there's nothing worse than driving your life on gravel roads with potholes, with speed bumps. And God's made a promise the path that he's going to make for us will be straight. It's going to be the best road to the best possible outcome. Now here's where we get all confused. Because we think somehow that God is, is doing this for our good. That God's going to work all this out and make it smooth and make it direct and make it straight for me. Listen, sometimes God does that. And I'm so thankful when he does that. But listen, God's got a bigger plan. Some of the things that he's doing in your life are for his benefit and for his glory. And that's a great promise. That no matter what happens in this life, it's going to be the best outcome for God, for his glory. No wonder this is a favorite verse for so many people. Uh, really quite a commitment on God's part when you think about it. I mean, who else can remove difficulties in front of us? And the answer is no one. Is anything too hard for the Lord? He can handle it. How are we ever going to get this thing out of our way? Well, God's in control. He's got it. I'm not going to sweat it. What is exactly God in control of? Well, the easy answer would be everything. God's in control of everything. But let me walk you through some scriptures to show you that that is exactly true. Because some of you are here this morning, you're like, eh, I don't know if God's in control of everything. Yeah, he is. Okay? First of all, uh, God's in control of the universe. We don't have time to read these verses, but in Acts chapter 17, starting in verse 24, uh, Paul is going through and he's making a case for God's sovereignty, for God's control in our life. And he's like, you know what? God's in control of the planets. Uh, the planets spin, the planets rotate, the seasons come, the seasons go. God's got it. You don't have to worry about it. God's also in control of the human race. You breathe in and you breathe out. Your heart beats because God makes it beat. 
God's in control of the human race. God's in control of the government. He's in control of the universe and everything in it. He's sovereign. He's in control. Here's the second thing that God's in control of. Rebellion. God's in control of rebellion. Think of Jonah. Remember his story? God's like, you're going to go here and you're going to do this. And Jonah's like, I am not going there and I'm not doing that. And how did that work out for Jonah? <laughs> not great. Not great at all. Jonah starts running in the exact, exact opposite direction, right? To get away from God, like somehow he's going to escape God. He rebelled against God and his plans. And so he gets in this boat, and he goes out on this boat, and all of a sudden this big wind comes. You know where that wind came from? Jonah chapter 1 verse 4 says, God appointed a great wind. And so all the people in the boat were terrified. They're wondering, how are we ever going to survive this? And they came to the conclusion that, well, it's Jonah's fault. His God is angry with him. Let's get rid of Jonah. We'll get rid of the problem. So they tossed Jonah overboard. And guess what? Was God done with Jonah? No. God appointed a great fish, is what Jonah chapter 1 verse 17 says. And after spending three days in the belly of this fish... This fish pukes Jonah out of his belly onto the shore. And now Jonah has decided that, you know what, maybe I'll go ahead and go along with God's plans. You see, God is in control over rebellion. His plans are not thwarted because you choose not to do what God wants you to do. He'll just find somebody else to do it or he'll make it so that you see that his plans are always best. You remember how the story ended up for Jonah. There was great revival brought to the people of Nineveh. Uh, Jonah wasn't happy about that. He was discouraged. He was depressed. He's having a little pity party. He sits down. And what does God do? In Jonah chapter 4 verse 6, God appointed a plant to grow up and provide him some shade. And see, God is so gentle and so compassionate towards Jonah. And he won his heart. And look, God is, God is sovereign. God is in control over rebellion. Here's the third thing God's in control of. God's in control of sin. He's, he's, he's sovereign over sin. You see, God is still in control even when people choose to sin against you and against him. And sin does not change God's plans. You can ask Judas about that. You guys are familiar with the story of Judas? He was one of the 12 disciples, right? And what is he famous for doing? Oh, just betraying the Son of God for some money. You know, no big deal, right? Psh. Would be better for you not to have been born than to do that. Now, let me ask you this question. Did God make uh, Judas do that? Did Judas have no other choice than he was born to betray the Son of Man? Absolutely not. It was Judas's choice. But because God knows everything, he's omniscient, he knows the outcome to every possible situation that you could ever possibly have. He knows the what ifs. He knows the options of A, B, C, and D. He knows exactly what we would do given any situation. He's going to use those things to bring about his plans. And so even something as sinful and despisable as betraying Jesus Christ for a few coins... God's going to use that to bring about his good purposes. Not only that, but God is in control over world events. That's what the whole story of Esther is about, isn't it? She was taken and she was put in the harem of the king. And because she was so beautiful through a series of events, she was able to stand before the king and make a request that would eventually save the nation of Israel from their utter and total demise. And the book of Esther is amazing because, you know what? God's name is not mentioned one time in the book of Esther. Did you know that? But all throughout the book of Esther, you can read it and you can know and you can sense that God is sovereign and that he is working. And as a matter of fact, it was Esther's Jewish uncle, Mordecai, who says to Esther, You have come to the kingdom for such a time as this. In other words, all of these awful things are happening, but God in his sovereign control has put you in a position to bring about some good things. That's God's sovereign plan. God is in control over world events. Look, I want to close this morning with Hebrews chapter 6, verses 17 through 19. And in these two verses, uh, actually three verses, uh, there's an amazing truth that I want us to grab hold of. Let me read them for you and then I'll, then I'll uh, draw that truth out. 
In the same way, God desiring even more to show to the heirs of the promise the unchangeableness of his purpose, interposed with an oath, so that by two unchangeable things in which it is impossible for God to lie, we who have taken refuge would have strong encouragement to take hold of the hope set before us. This hope that we have is an anchor of the soul. You want to know why God's promises are exceedingly great and precious? Because if God has said it, it's going to happen. It's going to happen. God doesn't lie. God doesn't forget. God doesn't stretch the truth. He doesn't overpromise and then underdeliver. If God says it, it's going to happen. And how many of us need an anchor for our soul? How many people are, are, are in the middle of a storm and man, the winds are blowing and the waves are crashing and they're huge and we're like, Where, where's this going to go? Can anything bring peace to me in this situation? And I'll tell you what brings peace to those situations. It's the promises of God. God's made a few promises. He said a few things and he's an anchor to my soul. And I don't know what's going to happen except I know that God, what God has promised is going to happen. And I'm going to trust in the Lord with all my heart. I'm going to lean not on my own understanding. I'm going to acknowledge him in all my ways and he will make my path straight. I will not doubt because God is in control. Do you believe that this morning? Do you believe that God is in control? Amen. Let's live it like we believe it.